Dr. Jeff Kenworthy, he's professor of sustainable cities in the Curtin University Sustainable Policy Institute, Curtin University, Perth, Australia, and guest professor at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. Thanks very much, Sharon. Transport is very important. It's a real shaper of, um, of cities. It's not just about moving people from A to B. And so what I want to concentrate on today is why rail systems are essential in creating eco-cities. And the two cover slides, uh, I think, speak a lot uh, where we're situated at the moment above a, a big freeway, which is served also by a metro station, uh, compared to the SkyTrain line there in Vancouver. It says quite a lot. I would hate to think how this place would function if it didn't have a, um, a subway station to feed it uh, when you're surrounded by that kind of environment. So what, what is the context for what I want to talk about today? Well, at the moment in the world there's a major policy debate that is going on about the virtue of buses compared to rail systems. And that's especially so that uh, now that bus rapid transit or BRT systems are being promoted largely on cost effectiveness grounds, you know, they're, they're cheaper to install than rail systems. But the issues um, concerning bus versus rail are not only about transport technologies, they're not just about simple economics, um, they're also about what transport systems do to urban form and urban design, it's uh, about what, uh, what can happen with parking requirements, what, what do the transit systems do to reduce car use, uh, what do they do to improve non-motorised use, and, and what do the systems do to, to actually change the overall economic performance of the metropolitan region? Do, do cities become more economically competitive or not? It's to do with energy use, how much energy use is reduced, and of course transport ex and externalities like emissions and transport deaths. So what we're really talking about is shaping whole cities. So the choice of whether you go with buses or with rail it really is at the heart of some of the most fundamental things we want to do in, in uh, creating eco-cities. This presentation uses actual data from cities worldwide to see some very systematic urban systems differences in cities with strong rail systems, what I call city strong rail cities, versus what I call weak rail cities, and those cities that have only buses, so no rail cities. And I'll explain what I mean by those in, in, uh, in the upcoming slide. Um, what I will do along the way is also provide you with some urban comparative data that I've been putting together for the last four years. And it's never been aired before, so um, this is the first time that this data has ever been revealed uh, here at the EcoCities conference, which really shows the critical nature of rail in developing EcoCities. Very quickly, a lot of people have noted that rail has some pretty good advantages, uh, both environmental and, and otherwise. Comfort and convenience, bigger vehicles, better stations and stop environments generally, greater seat availability, better ride quality, etc. They're more comfortable and convenient. Generally better schedule reliability and safety, that's uh, pretty, pretty standard. Better transfers between modes, particularly if the system is set up properly. No local odour or uh, air pollution and, and lower noise if the, if the system is done well. The sparks effect, this is something that engineers have known for a very long time, that if you, if you replace uh, a 10 minute bus service with a 10 minute light rail or tram service, you'll get a quantum increase in patronage. Um, it's just that people are attracted to electric modes of transport, which means we have to actually be very careful with electric cars as well, because the sparks effect might work with electric cars not just with public transport. Um, route clarity and strong system identity. Rail systems, you know where they go. They anchor the city. They're very legible. You, you can understand what the routes are compared to bus systems. This is very important. Rail systems have proven economic impacts on land values and rents, particularly in close, close proximity to rail stations and they attract higher density mixed use development opportunities close to stations. And I'm going to show this um, in, in some, some images. 
And rail can achieve significant shift of car drivers to transit. We, we had a 25% shift of morning peak drivers in Perth out of their cars into the rail system. And we couldn't do that with buses. San Diego had the same experience. They put buses on the freeways, no transfer of car drivers. They put a light rail system in, drivers transfer. And Carmen Hasklau, a professor from Wuppertal in, uh, in Germany, she concluded one of her studies about uh, comparing light rail transit with buses and she said, in the case of light rail, its main advantages turn out to be what are often considered to be disadvantages. It's high cost and inflexibility. Inflexibility becomes redefined as security by the same argument the main disadvantages of relying on conventional buses are what are usually assumed to be advantages, cheapness and flexibility. So what I want to do, oh, oh, by the way, that's the study that that quote came from at the end there. But what I want to do now is to look at these kind of things in relation to um, my study of cities around the world. I, I looked at cities, 60 cities in tremendous detail and I categorised them as strong rail, weak rail and no rail and that's just the list of cities with their 96 uh, uh, population. So we have a, a pretty big sample of the rail uh, cities and the no rail cities are a much smaller sample because frankly it's very hard today to find significant sized cities that don't have some rail system. The data are being updated with the help of a grant from the Helen and William Mazer Foundation for, in New Jersey for which I'm very, very grateful. So the way I def define strong rail cities is that, first of all, it's those cities that have 50% or more of their public transport passenger movement by rail. And what I, what I mean by rail is trams, LRT, metro, and suburban rail, so all rail modes. No less than 40% of the daily trips uh, that, pu that people make on public transport uh, are by, by rail, no less, 40% or more. And the ratio of the overall speed of rail to road traffic had to be 0.9 or higher. So in other words, uh, to be a strong rail city, you had to have um, a rail system speed, an overall rail system speed, which was coming close to parity with the car, if not uh, more. And you can see here that um, in the strong rail city, 74% of the passenger kilometres are by um, uh, rail, uh, the public transport passenger kilometres, and 43% weak rail. The no rail cities, obviously, none. One of the things that distinguishes strong rail cities from others is that they have a lot of reserved public transport route. They have a lot of... Um, of their network which is protected from road traffic and this is fundamentally important. You have to give public transport a speed advantage and the reality is that in cities that have got no rail systems, very little of the public transport system operates with that kind of protection. So reserve rights of way are really critical for transit speed advantage and even with light rail systems if you give them priority at traffic lights, you put them on their own right of way, they can also have uh, a speed advantage. And of course, the rights of way can also help to green the city, as in the top left-hand slide. Now, if we if we look at the overall speed of the whole public transport system, not just the rail speed, but how fast does the public transport system overall um, perform? And what we find is that in the strong rail cities, the ratio of overall public transport system speed to car speed is 0.86. So it's it's very well performing. The weak rail cities are a little less, uh, not so much rail. The bus cities are only half the speed of the, um, of, the, of, the, um, of the car. Now this is new data here and what I did was I looked at 32 cities around the world and I compared the, uh, the, the ratio of uh, the, the rail speed to the speed of cars. And very interestingly you have cities that, you know, like ha Hamburg and uh, Hong Kong and London which are you know, 1.4 to 1.6 times higher rail speed than they do um, average car speed. Perth, which is a real auto city, we've got you know, a good rail system, we're getting 1.31 times higher rail speed than car speed. Montreal and Los Angeles are around 0.92, they're about the same ratio, but poor old Calgary and Toronto down there are stuck at about 0.6 and 0.58. And, for those rail systems to perform better and to compete better, that ratio really needs to be improved. The red line is the 0.9 mark, so you can see most of the 
rail systems are better than this, uh, this, this mark of 0.9. If we look at the, the bus system speed in the same cities, and we look at the red vertical line at the 0.9 mark, you see that there's no city that actually exceeds that, that mark. Ham Hamburg comes close. They've got a very good bus system, very, uh, very well operating on, on rights of way. Um, Montreal, half the speed of cars, the bus system. New York, a very strong rail city. The buses are only 0.4 uh, the speed of the car system. So very, very clear what is happening there. One of the ways that we, want, we, we try to speed up car traffic is we build freeways. And automobile cities like in America, Australia, New Zealand, Canada have very high uh, freeway provision. The rest of the world has much lower freeway provision, but there are many cities that are building more freeways. But, you know, freeways do speed up traffic a bit in a system sense, but they promote car use. They actually increase our dependence on cars because if you, if you look at a graph of average car speed against per capita car use, you see that car use increases as the car speed increases. So we can conclude that higher congestion is actually very strongly associated with less use of cars in a city and we can strategically exploit that. Congestion acts as a brake on the development of automobile dependence the av as the average speed of cars increases, so does car use and vice versa. So um, if we try to remove congestion through freeway building, we just push the city more and more and more towards more car use. If on the other hand, we start tearing freeways down, oh, heaven forbid, what about the Turcot interchange? Let's get rid of it. Ch Changi Chong, they got rid of six kilometres of freeway in Seoul and the traffic speed improved. The car speed improved by getting rid of six kilometres of four-lane expressway because traffic behaves more like a gas than it does a liquid. It doesn't flood over everything if you remove road space. It actually starts to compress. And we need to actually start surgically removing freeways from the, from, from, from the tissue of our urban systems. What about urban form? Well, in the strong rail cities, they're very centred. 18% of the jobs in the central business district on average are in the centres of the cities compared to the no rail cities with about 10% of the jobs. But it's not just the CBD, but rail cities are also have what we call decentralised concentration. They develop significant centres outside of the central business district. And if we, if we build our centres around rail systems, we build them in a way that are very, very human very beautiful human kind of environments like in Munich and so on. And we build big centres in the suburbs. We can build these, um, these sub-centres that, that really do work, both around light rail systems and around uh, uh, metro systems, like in Los Angeles, like in Sydney. But we actually have to build the systems. What about parking spaces per thousand central business district jobs? Obviously, the strong rail cities have less parking. They enable cities to create beautiful environments in their centres. The no-rail cities, lots and lots of parking, more than one parking space for every two jobs. Centres in the suburbs, car-based or and supplemented by bus, public transport, very, very often very ugly, whereas centres that are based around, an, in, the, in this case, an, an U-Bahn system, uh, the, the, U, U, the U4 line in Munich, um, very beautiful, traffic-free, people-orientated green space. What about um, the level of service that is provided by public transport? Well, here in the, in the case of um, uh, the seat kilometres, the, uh, the annual seat kilometres per capita, you can see that the strong rail cities are way above the no rail cities in terms of the level of service that is actually provided. I'm updating these data right now, and that's the list of cities that I've, that I've updated so far. And I just want to provide you with just two or three significant trends in these cities that have uh, occurred between 96 and 2006. The first is the level of service that's been provided. The top part, the top part of this graph is what's happened to the bus seat kilometres per capita, the bus service. The middle graph is what's happened to the level of rail service provided and the bottom part of the graph is the overall system. 
And what you can see is that the rail seat kilometres have exploded in the level of provision. In the case of the Australian and the Canadian cities, the bus uh, supply has actually declined. So it's the, it, it really is the, um, uh, the rail systems that is providing the, the majority of growth in this factor. The US cities were the biggest winners. They increased by um, uh, almost 35% and uh, even the European cities, which already have good rail service, increased by 30%. What about, um, what about the usage of public transport? Well, this is the number of trips that are made per capita per year. And look, the pattern is always the same. The same pattern occurs. The strong rail cities, very high use of public transport. Weak rail, a lot better, again, than the, the bus-only cities. The reality is that... Um, Buses have to chase passengers. Bu buses have to go around and collect their passengers. Rail systems bring passengers to the system. They anchor the city. And they do that through transit-oriented development. What's been happening in the trend in public transport usage? Well, have a look at this. Um, the bus uh, boardings per capita, the trips per year, have increased a little bit. In the case of Singapore, Hong Kong, they've actually declined a little bit. But the rail boardings per capita have gone really strongly upwards, 26% in Canadian cities, 24% in American cities. So it is, again, the, uh, the, the rail systems that are leading the renaissance in the usage of public transport that we see around the world. And all cities have grown um, in, um, in public transport use except uh, the, the two big Asian giants, Singapore and Hong Kong, interestingly, have declined a fraction, but from very, very, very high levels. If we look at um, the total public transport use, don't worry about trying to read the numbers, I know it's very small, but just look at the blue, the blue line, which is the total public transport boardings per capita, the red line is the rail, and you can see that in the cities that have got high public transport use, that that high usage is built primarily on the basis of the rail system with very good bus feeder systems. The bus usage in strong rail cities per capita is actually higher than the total bus usage per capita in bus-only cities. So the bus systems do well in the rail cities as well because you're giving them their proper role, which is to, to feed the rail system and to provide service where rail can't go. So in terms of usage, um, we, we, we get this better usage because we're able to build transit-oriented environments around the system. This is an example here in Zurich. We know what's happened in Vancouver. If you're familiar with that city, the transformations have been simply extraordinary since this picture I took in 1987 at the Joyce Collingwood station, and now, you know, they've built a little miniature walking city around that station. And that is all fed by buses and people walk to it, people bike to it. And you can create these wonderful uh, green um, people oriented environments around the rail stations. And you can see here the transformative effect on urban form of putting a rail system in but not sterilising the station environments with park and ride. If you, if you build park and ride, um, it doesn't have this kind of effect. Down on the SkyTrain line, you can see the SkyTrain on the top left-hand slide um, at New Westminster Station. They've, they've created a really magic place around the station. This is not the typical uh, environment you think about when you think about a rail station. And yet, if you do the planning well, you do the urban design well, you consult the community, you, you get the public realm in good shape, you can create some wonderful stuff around rail systems. And it can happen very, very quickly. This is a picture I took in 1987, basically just a hole in the ground at Edmonds Station on the SkyTrain in, in Vancouver. And within a few years, they had built um, a small city around that rail station. And it is a very, very beautiful green public realm, notwithstanding that it's high rise. It doesn't matter that it's high rise, it's what's happening on ground level that's important. It's what livability you deliver to human beings on the ground level, on the interface between the buildings. Fruitvale Station um, in San Francisco, a transit-oriented development, this was a park and ride lot. They built it out with a beautiful 
transit-oriented development. And I think this is a great example because it's in a low-income area. It's not a, it's not a high-income neighbourhood. Maybe these pictures are a little bit biased, but you know, if you look at uh, you know, a bus interchange, say at West Edmonton Mall, um, you can see uh, the difference in the quality of the public environment. And here's an example from Vancouver across the, um, the Fraser River in the suburbs showing a different approach where there's a lot of parking. Um, it's not the same effect as building um, good quality urban form. Another piece of data is, well, how much of the all overall motorised movement in the cities, cars plus public transport, how much of that is by the public transport system? Well, in the strong rail cities, we're getting an average of 22% of all motorised movement by rail. In the bus only cities, 5%. There's no comparison, there's a four times difference here. And what we find in the cities is that, that those cities that have got um, the, the, the highest car use have also got obviously the lowest rail use. So, so you know, it, the, 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 the low car using cities are the cities that have got very strong um, rail systems. And again, I showed you the, the situation with the trips by public transport. This is how far people move on the public transport system. This is the passenger kilometres and you can see again that it is the rail systems that are leading the charge in terms of how much um, public transport has increased in the 10 years from 95 to 2005. Um, buses have increased as well, but not to the same extent as, uh, as the rail systems. So um, Perth, we have, uh, in Perth we've put in a, a very good um, rail system and um, it, the average speed of this new line is around uh, 80, 80 to 90 kilometres per hour actually and uh, the, the, the rail usage in Perth has increased fivefold uh, since the early 1990s. Fantastic renaissance in, uh, in rail usage. And if we look at uh, the cities uh, in terms of speed, we can look at the ratio of overall rail speed to road traffic speed and the total per capita use of public transport, uh, of rail usage, I should say. You see three, three groups of cities. The top group of cities are cities that we can say have very high use of rail and they have a very competitive speed and they have an extensive rail system. Then you've got another group of cities in the middle which have moderate use of rail, but they suffer either from a lack of adequate speed competitiveness or system coverage. And then you've got a group of cities that have got relatively low uh, or poor rail use due to poor system coverage, though often with highly speed competitive systems, but there's just not enough of them. Or you have cities with poor rail use due to both poor system coverage and poor competitiveness in speed. In terms of how much movement of people rail contributes, it's actually quite extraordinary because we can see here that if we add up the rail and the car passenger kilometres and we take rail as a proportion of the total, we find that, you know, in Hong Kong, the rail system is actually moving 70% of all the daily movement in the city. And even in Singapore, it's 30%. Berlin, 20, uh, uh, London, uh, Berlin, 28%. London, 26%. Very high. But then there's another group of cities, 18, in fact, more than half, have less than 5% of the daily movement of people by rail. And it is these kind of cities that need this, this boost from, uh, from a better rail system. We see also that uh, in the strong rail cities, um, the proportion of trips by private transport, by car, is, is less than half, whereas in the bus-only cities, 84%. Non-motorised mode use, walking and cycling, is better in the rail cities. 31% of daily trips by foot and bike, 11% in the bus-only cities. So if you're building a city around rail, you have the opportunity, if you get your urban design right, you get your planning right, you have the opportunity to create superior walking environments because rail is very, very space efficient. And this is what they've done in Portland here. They've, they've actually transformed their central area. They've done it with a light rail. They've done it with a streetcar system in the Pearl District. 
very confined areas of the city, but nonetheless, they are like ripples in a pond. They are really beginning to transform the city. And of course, in Europe, in Karlsruhe, in Geneva, again in Portland here, we see um, the effect of putting surface light rail systems. Um, what about energy use? We know that oil is peaking or has peaked. We know that oil is going to become a real problem, a geopolitical problem in terms of war. We know that it's going to become a problem of cost. And the rail cities have got much lower per capita uh, energy use in transport than uh, cities that try to do it all with buses. Transport externalities, um, emissions, this is the, uh, the, the kilograms of nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxide, SO2, volatile hydrocarbons. Um, it's very clear. The per capita emissions are much lower in cities that base their, their public transport system around rail. And um, the pattern, again, is, is very, very predictable. By the way, I have a paper, I have a full uh, refereed uh, academic journal article which has all this data and more, um, and it's all uh, statistically um, validated. The differences are statistically significant in each of those columns. So it's all been done uh, with statistical rigour. Um, and transport deaths, you know, very, very important. How, how, many, um, how many people uh, are we losing? Um, a year in, in, in the transport system. And um, it's very clear that, that we, we lose people uh, in transport systems in proportion to our exposure to the automobile. So the high car using cities have high death rates. The low car using cities, particularly the ones based around urban rail, have very low transport death rates. Um, and I, I would suggest also, looking at the bottom right hand slide, that. Um, that we, we can create a more civil-minded city, a better, a better city, a more uh, well-mannered city if we uh, can get ourselves out of cars. So um, some conclusions, just very quickly. I think it's fairly obvious that, that the strong rail cities are systematically better performing across virtually all the factors that are of significance and that are of concern in developing ecological cities, including the qualitative factor which is hard to measure, but you can see it visually, of a better quality, more human-oriented public realm, especially in the centres, both the central business district and the sub-centres. And the mechanisms for those advantages of urban rail are the legibility of the rail systems, the way people, they become part of the mental map around which people shape their perceptions of an urban system. They're permanent. Nobody's going to come and rip them up. A busway you can take out overnight. You can, it, it's politic, it, it, it can disappear according to the wind of politics. The positive image of rail in the mind of public and business community, people's willingness to use rail systems over buses for a variety of reasons, comfort and convenience and reliability and so on. But this is not an anti-bus talk. I said that the systems that are, are based on rail actually have higher bus usage than the cities that even try to just use buses alone. And so buses are essential public transport providers to areas that can't be served by rail and many other areas of the city. Buses provide the critical feeder systems um, and uh, they are well patronised when they're, when they're integrated with rail. Rail and bus form an integrated multimodal transport system that provides competition with the car. It's not a competition between buses and rail. It's a competition between the car and public transport. And the way to win that war is to integrate your public transport system using all the modes that are necessary, ferries, trams, light rail, commuter rail, whatever. Public transport should be seen as a multimodal system whose chief aim is to compete with and reduce dependence on the car building a virtuous circle, not a cycle of decline, but a virtuous circle. And finally, there is a renaissance going on around the world, um, and the key to that is, I believe, urban rail systems. And we won't ever change any significant size city into a more ecological model without high quality urban rail, and it's time to start transferring all those road funds that are being used to, 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 to rebuild the Turcotte interchange 
into the public transport system. You've got $3 billion. Build, use it on public transport. Thanks very much.